It's so much about the decisions, and it's really amazing that one decision, one decision can change the whole direction of our life. Over the last few weeks, we've been in this powerful series, this faith-building series, looking at the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 11 is the great listing of all of the great heroes, men and women of faith from the Old Testament. And today I want to turn our attention to perhaps the greatest man of faith in the Old, Old Testament. His name is Moses. Moses was an incredible man who had a tremendous belief in God. He was an unusual man. He had an unusual background and an unusual upbringing. And God used his circumstances and his situations to bring about a revolution in an entire nation. Look with me, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're turning there, uh, he, uh, faith is so important because faith pleases God. In fact, uh, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So your faith really does matter. Your faith is a huge part of your life. The reason we've been spending these previous Sundays talking about faith is because it really is the apex of the Christian experience is your confidence in God, is your belief in God. And I hope that God is taking your faith to a new level and your confidence in the Lord as we've looked at these great heroes and at these fantastic passages over the last few weeks. Hebrews 10.38 says, Right people live by faith. And you know, when you have faith, you actually will have more joy in your life. You will have more peace. You will have more confidence. You will have more strength to go through what you're going through. So every single one of us, no matter where you are in life, can use more faith. We need more faith, don't we? We need that faith. And faith really is a decision that we make. Some people think that faith is like, you know, something that's predetermined or that our life is all predetermined. But, but the choices that you make will have significant implications into the outcomes of your life. In fact, sometimes even one decision, one specific decision can change the whole direction of your life. And it was true in the life of Moses. Moses' faith was built in the middle of crisis. Some of us today are in the middle of a crisis and you're like, God, why does my life go from crisis to crisis to crisis? You know what? It's in those moments that God forges faith. People who have a very calm, placid, consistent life that's just like this don't have any faith. People whose life it goes up and down and there's a struggle and then there's more adversity and then there's more problems. Those are the people that God brings faith out of. And we're going to see several situations in the life of Moses where God just builds his faith. The first decision that he makes is to leave the household of Pharaoh. Crisis number one, faith, boom. Then he liberates the Hebrew people from Egyptian captivity, boom, chaos, Crisis, faith explodes. Then he parts the Red Sea, faith explodes. Throughout the life of Moses, crisis, crisis, crisis. So if you're in a crisis today, you need to know something today. God will build your faith in a crisis. Don't get discouraged today. Just recognize God's taking your faith to a new level. But let's look at this man, Moses, who had an unusual home. He, he, he's the greatest man in the Old Testament. And I know there's some great heroes and, and we can put Abraham, and we can put Elijah, and we can put some other dudes on that list. But let me tell you why Moses is the greatest. Moses was handed the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. He saw God face to face in the burning bush. He parted the Red Sea. He brought ten plagues on Pharaoh and a whole lot of other stuff in the Bible. Moses is considered in the book of Deuteronomy to be the greatest prophet of the Old Covenant. I mean, he was a dude. And furthermore, Moses had a particular, a peculiar upbringing. If you remember the story of Moses, Moses was born to a Hebrew family during a crisis time. His birth was in a crisis, for crying out loud. Pharaoh was upset that, that, that all the Hebrew people were multiplying. And he was afraid they were going to take over the Egyptians. And so he made a law that all the Hebrew boys, two, two years old and under, would be thrown into the Nile River. But when Moses' parents saw him, they couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. And they hid him 
for three months. In fact, look with me, if you would, in verse 23 of Hebrews 11. By faith, after he was born, he was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. So Moses' parents practiced civil disobedience. The law is this. We're going to go with God's law. God's law is greater than man's law. We can't throw the baby in the river. But when they couldn't hide the baby any longer, they made a little ark. They made a little basket and they put some pitch in the bottom of it. And they sent Moses on a little tour down the Nile River. He was rescued by the daughter of Pharaoh and he was adopted into the home of Pharaoh. And many years later, commentators and scholars believe that Pharaoh beca- that, that uh, Moses became the heir to Pharaoh's throne. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Moses is now a little baby and he needs a nanny. Moses' sister's been watching. She busts out of the reeds and it's like, I've got the nanny for you. And she runs home and she's like, Mom, you got to put your resume in for this gig down here at the palace. It's going to be awesome. Moses' mom gets the job and she has the opportunity to influence the life of her son. She teaches him about the things of God. She teaches him about his Hebrew culture and background. And Moses will never get away from that his entire life. Even though he grows up in the household of Pharaoh, he understands his Hebrew identity. Now you want to talk about somebody conflicted. All of the Egyptian gods and just the spiritual religious life surrounding the Egyptians, the complete opposite of the Jews and the Hebrews. Um, His family is slaves, they're oppressed, and yet his adopted family is very wealthy. And so Moses has this dual identity going on in his whole life. He's the most educated. I mean, the Egyptian culture was one of the most advanced in the world at this time. He has a world-class education. He has world-class leadership skills. He has been taught and he is friends with the best. And yet there's something in the heart of Moses that cannot stay where he is. Sometimes your faith will lead you to change. Sometimes your faith will lead you to to go to a place that you maybe never thought you could go, but you realize I cannot stay where I am and follow God's will for my life. I love this passage in Acts 11, 23. It says, when they saw the child was beautiful, they didn't fear the king's edict. Now, that's true. Every parent looks at their baby and thinks they're beautiful. Is that right? I mean, I've been to the hospital a lot and I've visited a lot of babies and I've had moms hand me their Babies that are just terribly ugly. I mean, cone heads and all red and all, you know, whatever. And they're like, look how beautiful he is. And I'm like, yeah, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Amen. Beautiful. I don't think this particular passage is talking about the fact that Moses had a symmetrical face and he had all of his digits. I think what the passage is saying um, could be understood by Stephen the great Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7, who speaks of this encounter. And he says this, that um, his parents uh, understood that Moses had a special mission and purpose from God. So when they say he was beautiful, they saw something in him. God's going to use my son. I can't throw him in the river with the crocodiles. God's going to use him. They saw something special. By the way, that should be the role of every Christian parent is to see something in their child that maybe nobody else sees. And this bold act of faith set the direction of the life of Moses. I'll tell you what, parents, we cannot make all the decisions for our children But we can forge a faith direction that leaves a huge imprint on their life and soul. Amen? That's what parents should be doing. That's what Christian homes are about. It's about setting direction, right? I I can't make all the choices for my kids, but I want to make it really hard for them to not serve God. Because I want to do such a bang up job showing them the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And Moses had that kind of home. And now his mom's blessed. She's doubly blessed. She gets to take care of her boy and she gets paid. Amen. How about that? Wow. Pretty good. Well, faith does four things that I want us to see here from the life of Moses. Faith, first of all, makes a choice. 
You cannot be a person of faith if you can't call the ball, if you can't make the choice. Faith is a choice, not a chance. And this one decision in Moses' life changes his whole direction. Look at this in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the short-lived pleasures of sin. What a big choice. Acts chapter 7 tells us he was 40 years old. He said, I can't do it anymore. Can you imagine turning your back on your adopted mom and, 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 and the potential throne of Egypt and all of the power and education and authority and influence? and I, I, I mean, everything that a man could ever want are right there at the feet of Moses. And yet, he, at the same time, he recognizes that something is missing. I can't do it. And he makes the boldest choice of all. He leaves the house of Pharaoh. <laughs> Living by faith is a choice. It's a choice. Faith is a, is a choice. It's a choice that we make. Every morning when we wake up, we have a choice to make. Am I going to follow God's paths or am I going to follow the path of the world? Am I going to do my own thing? A lot of people today are trying to straddle the fence. They're trying to put one foot in the world and one foot on the things of God. And the result of that is total chaos. It's problem after problem after problem. Moses realized, I got to either get on God's team or I got to get on the world's team. I cannot do both. It took him a while. 40 years old, not exactly a young man, not an old man, but not a young man. I think this is something that he thought about very significantly. But he made the choice to follow the Lord. He chose. Acts 7, 22 uh, elaborates on this a little bit more. It says, So Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in his speech and actions. Moses was not a chump. He was not a loser. He, he, he again, had great skill, ability. He had great training. He had, he had great abilities. And now God is about to use that in a powerful, powerful way. Moses thought he was leaving all that behind, but in reality, God's going to resurrect all of this training and background because he's going to use that in his life when he comes back and liberates the people. But, but for our, our discussion this morning, Moses makes a bold choice. And the choice was to follow God rather than to follow what he had been taught. He gave up wealth, prestige, and authority so he could follow the Lord. So first of all, faith refuses to compromise. It makes the choice. The second thing we see is that faith thinks. Faith thinks. Uh, verse 26, it says, For he considered the reproach for the sake of the Messiah to be gr of greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since his attention was on the reward. Uh, this word considers means to contemplate, to think about it. Moses is... You know, it wasn't a decision that he made just one day when he rolled out of bed and, you know, had some bad sushi the night before. It was, it was something that he weighed. It was something that, that he deliberated over. He thought about it. Am I going to serve Egypt and Pharaoh or am I going to serve the Lord God? And he weighed it out. Just like you make big decisions. You know, whenever you got a decision... Uh, where you go to college, you're going to think about that, aren't you? You know, if you're a student, you're going to put your application in several places. You're going you're to study it. What does it cost? Who do I know that's going there? What majors do they have? You're going to look at all that. You're going to contemplate it. It's a big decision. When you buy a house, it's a big decision, isn't it? How much does it cost? What neighborhood? What schools? Who lives there? What's it going to be like? Is it better than my other house? I mean, that kind of stuff. You're going to look at all that contemplate it. Moses is contemplating. He's thinking. I got Egypt over here. I got all this money. I got all these cute girls running around the palace. I got all this. Or I could go suffer with the people of God. Wow. And what's crazy is he chose the hard route, right? Now listen, if the bottom falls out of your life, you realize you need a change, right? Things were good for Moses. 
Things were not bad. But there was just something in him that couldn't get settled with God's direction for his life. And as he thought about it, he knew that he had to go with God. Sometimes God will lead us to make bold changes in our life when everything is good. Why would you do that? Because God wants me to. God doesn't just speak in a crisis. Sometimes God speaks in the middle of blessing. Sometimes God speaks in the, the moments when we think everything's perfect and better and God takes us down another path. And so he contemplates this. He, he thinks about it. He thinks deeply about it. We thought deeply about our kids' names. We had rigorous debate in our home before our kids were born about what we were named. When you name a kid, would you agree that's a big deal? It's a big deal because the kid's stuck with the name like forever, right? And my wife's real creative and real artsy, and so she came up with all these names, you know, and they kind of terrified me, to be honest with you. Some of them did. And she wanted to name our little boy Rhett, like Rhett Butler from Gone with the Wind, you know, Rhett. I was like, honey, I can't do that. We'd have to decorate the nursery and Gone with the Wind theme. I can't, I can't go there. Rhett. I just can't. I, please don't do that to me. Then she wanted to name our little boy Tyner because it's a family name. Tyner, T-I-N-E-R. And I was like, if he's small and his name is Tyner, they're going to call him Tiny Tyner. And the kids are going to beat him up on the playground. Don't give your kid a name that gets him beat up. Bad. Don't do it. So we had all this rigorous debate. We, we ended up with Zane. I think that's a lot better than Rhett. Not to offend anybody here if that's your middle name or whatever it may be. Or if your name's Tyner. Sorry about that. My daughter's name, we call her Bryn. Her name is Sterling Bryn. We were going to name her Bryn Sterling, but we didn't want her initials to be BS, Right? You have to think about these things, right? you got to contemplate these things. Good choices are thought through. So this wasn't just a snap decision that, that one day Moses made. He, he recognized, I'm leaving all this behind, but i got to do the will of God. Listen, the will of God is greater than comfort, money, ease, pleasure, and the approval of men. It's better than all that put together. Moses recognized it. So he thought about it. He thought about it. He mo made the bold choice. And then notice what it says in verse 27. It says he, he left. By faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as one who sees who is invisible. There's two things there in verse 27. One, it says he wasn't afraid. The more faith that you have, the less fear you will have. The more that your fear increases, the more the less faith that you'll have. Moses' faith was stronger than his fear. In fact, he feared God a lot more than he feared humanity. But the question is, well, what is this talking about? It says that he left being afraid. If you read the story in the book of Exodus, when Moses leaves Egypt originally, he flees for his life and he is afraid. So is the Bible contradictory here in Hebrews 11? I don't think so. This is talking about the second time that Moses leaves Egypt. The first time he leaves as a fugitive. The second time he leaves as a champion. Right? He leaves with, with, with two million people going with him. Right? And he's like, I just kicked Pharaoh's butt. I got him under control. I'm not afraid anymore. God's big and bad. God took care of Pharaoh. We just threw down the ten plagues and you know whatever else God wants to do. I got this. So... Moses, Moses leaves, he leaves Egypt behind. I, I want to submit to you today, if you're going to be a bold person of faith, there's some things you have to leave in your past. If you live in the past, you will never embrace the future of faith. You've got to leave some stuff behind. You've got to leave behind some old mindsets. You've got to leave behind some old attitudes. You've got to leave behind... Some old friendships. Amen? When I first started walking with God, one of the first things the Lord put on my heart was, Ryan, you need some new friends. I love my old friends. But my old friends were going this direction. And I was going this direction. And I was trying to take them with me, but it wasn't working. And unfortunately, we got to leave some things behind. Doesn't mean you don't care about your old friends. Of course you do. 
You just can't keep doing what you've always been doing. Faith will lead you to leave. Faith will lead you to leave some things in your past, whatever it may be. Let it go. Let it go. Let, let your faith be greater than your fear. And by faith, he left Egypt behind. Some old stresses, some old traditions, some old patterns, some old habits, some old whatever it may be, fill in the blank with your own life. Leave it behind. And he left Egypt. Egypt represented Moses' past, not his future. The promised land, which was the goal, that represented the future. We need to be people that are moving towards the future and the purposes and the callings of God Almighty more than we are trying to hang on to all of our past sins. I see this all the time. People come to Edge Church. They give their lives to Christ. They start growing in the Lord. God starts transforming and doing awesome stuff. And then they go and they get counsel, spiritual counsel, from all their old friends. And they wonder, why is there such a big struggle? It doesn't work that way. You can't get spiritual advice from people that are not moving the same direction that you are. You've got to leave some things behind. Leave it behind. The more you keep going back to the old way is the, more that you, the less that you will give to God and the less faith that you'll have in your life. Let that go. So Moses thinks, he chooses, he makes a bold choice. One choice changes the whole direction of his life. I can't live in the house of Pharaoh. Then he leaves. He leaves some things behind. The, the final thing that we see in his life is that he practices. He practices. Faith practices. But let me mention one more thing when it comes to leaving behind. I was watching the testimony of one of my good friends that I did master's work with at the seminary named Afshin Ziafat. Afshin was a friend of mine. We studied together. Uh, we played on the seminary flag football team together, actually. Amen. That was fun. Good old days back in the day. Afshin grew up in Iran, or he was born in Iran. And at two years old, he moved to Houston, Texas. His family moved during the um, big transition, like in the 1970s, like in Iran, you know, the big coup that happened. And he spoke Farsi. And so his dad was a Muslim doctor from Iran, and he hired an American tutor to come to the house and read books to his, his son. And so Afshin's trying to learn English, and his tutor's reading him, you know, the books. And the last day that the tutor's with him, she leaves a Bible. And that Bible goes in the closet, doesn't even think about it. For 10 years, the Bible just sits there. One day, out of curiosity, he's cleaning out his closet, he sees the Bible, he begins to read about the person of Jesus Christ, and this guy becomes a Christian. His dad is a Muslim doctor. And he knows, oh my goodness, my dad is going to kill me if I become a Christian. I cannot do this, you know. And uh, he starts going to church. Like he starts sneaking around on Sunday mornings. He would change clothes, you know, when he would get to church and then before he would come home. So his dad wouldn't know. And every Sunday morning he just happened to be with friends, you know. And He's a teenager, and he would try to intercept the mail from the church. You know, the church mails out little postcards and letters and stuff like that. He would, like, try to get to the mail to pull the stuff out before his mom could, could look at it. Uh, he would hide his Bible, you know, in his room so his parents wouldn't see it. Most kids are hiding other stuff. He's hiding a Bible, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. One day, the Muslim doctor, the father, says, What's wrong with you, son? Something in right with you. And he says, Dad, I'm a Christian. And his dad said, you have to leave our home. I disown you. And so my friend as a high school student, as a boy, has to leave his home and moves out. Many, many, many years later, his relationship with his dad is restored. His dad's still not a Christian today, but they do have a relationship. But my friend had to consider the cost. I'm going to either make my dad happy and say I'm a Muslim... Or I'm going to follow Christ and do what God has said. It's a big choice, isn't it? That's a hard decision to make, isn't it? Wow. My friend did it with courage. Today, he flies to a neighboring country there next to Iran. And Iranian pastors come over and he's involved in training Iranian pastors. Is that not amazing? 
Only in the wisdom and counsel of God could something like that even be conceived or thought of. It's incredible. Incredible. It started with one bold choice, one bold act of faith. Dad, I'm a Christian. I know that your dad is probably not a Muslim doctor. But I do believe there's people in your life that your faith, if you really go all the way with Jesus and really all the way with the Lord, you're going to upset some people in your life. There's going to be some people that are disappointed, a friend, a family member, or somebody. Somebody's going to look at you and go, she's crazy. What's wrong with him? But we have to decide, like Moses, are we going to hang on to the approval of others or do we care more about moving in the direction that God has set before us? And Moses made that choice. He made that decision. He rocked the boat. He renounced his heritage. <laughs> I mean, he's, he, he walked away from everything that he knew because he knew that it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing. Faith practices. Faith practices. Now, faith is not just a theory. Sometimes when you read about faith on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker, it's like people are like, ooh, faith. Like, ooh, you know, like this makes you feel good. Unicorns and rainbows and faith, you know. And people put little trinkets in their house. Faith, you know, things like that. Listen, faith is real stuff. Faith should always lead to action. James chapter 2 says, faith without deeds is what? It's dead. It isn't real faith. So we got to back up the faith with the deeds. Moses had the goods. Look at this in verse 28. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. And when the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. Wow. Moses instructs the people to shut themselves in their homes at the Passover and to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And Moses puts it all on the line. If God comes through, this is miraculous. If God doesn't do what he said, this is the train wreck for Moses. Moses looks like a complete fool. The angel of death comes over and spares all of the Hebrew people because they got the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, which is a foreshadowing of the real Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that would come many years later, that was a sacrifice for our sins. But faith leads to action. God said, I'm going to protect you, but you've got to put the blood of the Lamb on the door. God said, I'm going to split open the Red Sea, but you guys have to walk across. See, a lot of folks think that faith is all about what God's going to do. I want to submit to you today, there's some things that only God can do. There's some things that only you can do. God pushed open the Red Sea, but the people had to hustle, right? The angel of death came through the town, but the people had to apply the blood. And when you put faith into action, you understand there's responsibility and there's the power of God. So, as a follower of Jesus, I recognize there's things I cannot do that only God can do, and I'm good with that, but I recognize that i got to be responsible with the things that God's put before me. And if you have a faith that is all dependent on yourself, a, a self-faith, or if you have a faith that's all dependent on God and doesn't recognize responsibility, you're going to be all out of whack. So in verse 28 and 29, it's the practice of faith. Faith is an action. It, 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 it's not passive. Uh, it, it's something that, that, that causes us to move. Moses had to lift his staff. God parted the waters. Uh, the Passover and the Red Sea parting uh, is something that's awesome. Amazing. Um, if you're looking for a job today, let me give you some spiritual advice. You should pray, but you should also put your resume out. Amen? Amen. Right, I talk to people sometimes, and they're like, Pastor, I need a new job. I'm like, well, how many resumes have you sent out, you know? Well, I haven't sent out any, but I'm just waiting for God to provide, you know? I mean, let me just tell you, faith and works, they go together, right? 
What does God want you to do? I always laugh. I get these LinkedIn requests all the time. Do you guys get those, those emails? So-and-so wants you to sign up for LinkedIn. I'm not a member of LinkedIn. I don't care about LinkedIn. I don't really even care about my Facebook account most of the time. But I always know when I get a LinkedIn email that somebody's looking for a job. Either somebody just got fired or somebody's about to quit. <laughs> That's what it means every time. You know, it's like you're blowing your cover, bro. You know, when I get the LinkedIn email, it exposes everything. Let me, let me say this to you. If you're looking for a job, you ought to get on LinkedIn and you ought to pray and fast. You ought to do both, right? Let God part the waters and you start running, right? You lift up the staff and then see what God will do, amen? That's what it is. We, we, we need a faith that's practical, Faith is not just something in a museum. Faith is not just something that we theorize about. Faith is something that we do and practice every day. And a mature person in faith recognizes God wants me to act. And too many people in the body of Christ are waiting for God to do all the heavy lifting. Listen, man, if you're going to be successful in life, you got to sweat. you got to hustle you got to work. You can't have a godly home and a Christ-centered marriage by accident. won't happen. You can't be successful in your job and in your work by standing around. You have to work. You have to pray and trust God, but you got to do your part too. Moses saw it. Moses saw it. And the more you practice, the better you get. That's what's so great. The more you, Faith is like a muscle, man. Everybody here could get stronger if they got on a workout plan. Some of you are on a workout plan. But, you know, everybody can get stronger. Now, you may not be like Mr. Bodybuilder on the cover of the magazine, but you could get stronger, right? Faith is a muscle. Every person can get stronger. Sometimes we look at faith and we're like, well, I don't have the gift. Some people are just more spiritual than me. I don't have the gift. Faith is not a gift. Faith is not a talent. Faith is a muscle that has to be exercised, and all of us can grow and learn in the area of faith. When I was a kid, my parents were bound to determine that I was going to be a successful musician. They signed me up for piano lessons, and my parents were, like, passionate about it. My dad was a pianist. My mom was a wannabe pianist. And my brother and I were going to be concert pianists. It was, it was, it was determined. So I'm a little kid taking lessons. My little brother's three years younger than me. I would sit down to practice the song. I would play it. <laughs> My little brother would just hear the song without even reading the music, without going to the lesson. He could play it better than me, you know. <laughs> and he had, he's just three years younger, and he doesn't even know anything about the piano. And he's like, you know, it's all flowing together. My parents signed him up for lessons. I'm practicing religiously 30 minutes a day because my parents told me I had to. So I'm in there working it every day, you know, practicing the piano. I'm so miserable and so bored. In fact, really one of the greatest days of my life was the day that I quit piano. I found out years later, as an adult, my mom finally broke down and told me that the teacher came to her and said, please let Ryan quit, he's miserable. <laughs> and my mom gave me the speech, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. And I'm like, mom, it was one of the greatest days of my life to not have to take piano. My brother had the gift, though. My brother today is a concert pianist. Now, when we got a little older, he started practicing, like, all the time. I mean, I remember the piano banging, like, no, 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 no. My brother can play concertos with his toes. I mean, it's unbelievable, man. He has the gift. I didn't get the gift. I recognize I will never be a concert pianist. By the way, I'm good with that. But I'll never be the, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I recognize I'll never play basketball in the NBA. Don't, don't have the gift, the gift to do it. I'll never be in the Space Force. Amen? I'm, I'm, I'm really good with that, though. You know, I'm okay. It's, it's all right. Faith is not a gift. Faith is a muscle that every person can exercise. So we have no excuses. We can be as close to God as, as we want to be. We can, we can be as faith-filled as we want to be. We have tremendous opportunity to think, to choose, 
to leave and to embrace everything that God has put before us. Faith is forged in a crisis. It's time for us to decide what God wants us to do. Let's bow together for a word of prayer.